thank you all indeed for sticking around. I hope uh, everyone has uh, gotten over their lunch, di lunch dip a little bit, and otherwise we'll just uh, try and wake you up a little bit. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, but first of all, let's uh, indeed get an introduction from the parties that we haven't heard about uh, before. I mean, uh, maybe let's start with you, Abba. I think we heard a little bit about your background already. Uh... <laughs> oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, Eben Egeman, the Chief Risk Officer of uh, Egon Bank. And then Egon Bank, indeed, is an is old corporate. But part of Egon Bank is knap, a fintech. Yeah, go ahead. Hi everyone, um, I'm Gilad Amir. I'm a board member at the Miris Group and Alup, the developers of Hyloop, Hyperloop. Um, I was the head of Fintech of Lloyd's Banking Group until recently. Um, prior to joining Lloyd, uh, I filled in um, a bunch of roles as a CEO, founder, investor, and board member um, in different fintechs since 2003. So I really had the opportunity to be on both sides of the fence and, and relate to many of the things that, that the different speakers have said today. Uh, I'm, the, um, I'm the least qualified to be on this panel. I'm neither a chief risk officer nor a banker. I'm a liver transplant surgeon who owns a bank in Austria. And uh, I had to learn risk very, very fast, becoming uh, the vice chairman of the supervisory board. So I learned about risk from the other side of the fence and what uh, risk for a bank really means and how fintech and the legacy banks can come together in managing this risk. So hopefully I can give some fresh perspectives as a layperson. Sounds very good. Yeah, you can hold on to that. And indeed, Jeroen, uh, very much thanks also for, for joining us in the panel. I think you already gave us some a nice heads up on some uh, some of your thoughts of the digital bank. Uh, and I was actually very curious to hear you a little bit about the, the thoughts that you heard afterwards. I think they're moving in a bit of a different direction on from the and then side on uh, actually the internal change and the challenges of that. I think that must be something you ran into as well. Uh, and indeed sort of the, the, the digital, the open banking infrastructure must be also something that's very often on your plate, so. Yeah, yeah, so so um, I think there are, are some beautiful examples uh, in the last few years within ABN AMRO that we are facing uh, and developing. So we launched uh, three challenger banks within the, within the last 12 months. Um, and I think that these, uh, challenging banks can either give us insights on how to transform as a, as, as a group or either uh, what we need to do on a strategy, strategy level or risk level uh, on the backbone uh, uh, as a bank. Um, so I think that uh, these challenger banks and also this uh, weekend we have, uh, we organize uh, uh, Beyond Banking Days uh, here in Amsterdam. Um, and there are some brilliant ideas uh, coming out of that. Uh, we had last year, we had 42. Um, pity that only survi uh, two survived. Uh, but yeah, um, looking but forward to that. But do you, for example, see that as, for example, the Beyond Banking is also an initiative by ABN AMRO. Is, do you see that as a sort of a, a step towards open banking as well? I mean, is it this sort of an experiment that you see might end up in actually really opening up? Um, I think it's, a, yeah, it's a way of exploring, yeah. Um, I think it's um, uh, reaching out to to um, the parties around ABN AMRO uh, and f for, f especially to learn a lot. So we have a lot of smart and capable people within a ABN AMRO. But um, yeah, what I just said in my uh, my keynote is that the developments are going that fast and that uh, on uh, on uh, a rapid pace that you cannot keep up with that. Uh, on the internal side, so you need to get that knowledge from uh, from outside. No, uh, exactly, indeed. Uh, and Gilad, I think you also were in inside of a bank uh, before where the digital transformation was also quite on the well on the agenda. Did you recognize the story before from NN about how actually how tricky it is to, to transform the organization from inside out? Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that, perhaps? Well, well I must admit I don't have much to add. It was a very, Amir had a very good uh, uh, speech and uh, can relate to, I think that everything he said about this tension between innovation and transformation change to the traditional way of doing things, um, where there is a clear need to change. There is uh, a clear understanding that things cannot continue this way, but between this acknowledgement to actually transforming the business and launching new proposition, building new capabilities, uh, there is a gap. Um, I think that, well, this gap will be closed. Okay, so I think that banks are building um, uh, new sourcing processes, new, new GRC frameworks um, to innovate at scale 
uh, in yeah. a much more structured and systematic way, but it will take time. We are not there yet, from okay. my experience. But you recognize also, I think, sort of the cultural aspects of that, right? So I think because that was very important that it's, it's, we talk a lot about legacy systems, but uh, the legacy culture or the legacy of beliefs, I think it was, ma was named, uh, is a quite an important factor that's very often hard to sort of grasp. So, so, uh, so I don't share the I don't share this opinion about culture. I think that it's mainly a matter of perceived necessity. Okay. Because if you think of Lloyd's, Barclays, HSBC, you have so many good people that work there, are working there, and they have all the delivery capabilities one could think of, everything and anything you can think of. I think that it's mainly a matter of perceived necessity. Once the board and the execs decide that they want to make it happen, they will make it happen faster and better than any other fintech on, on, on earth. And I know, I know firsthand, right? So, so I think it's mainly a matter of perceived necessity. So it really is a t top down, there's a strong requirement to give the right direction then? Absolutely. Okay. How, do you, how do you see that, Eva? I think that's also... Yeah, right? I, I do understand, but a slightly different f uh, vision. Uh, in fact, I, I, I worked at the big banks, at ING, at ABNMRO. I even worked in this building, so it's good to be back. Um, but um, is this is a bit of a cultural thing, or, or maybe cultural is not the right word, but more the government of the big organization that makes it slower. I think the, the picture uh, in one of the presentations about the big boat and the small boat, the big boat is just small, uh, it's just slower. That, that's by nature it is. And that's what I experienced as well. I, I used to work for, for AB Nimro, and I fully recognize your story about having a great idea, even having support from the board, but then there were the 14 departments you should, uh, and, and maybe uh, 20 meetings where you get the, uh, the approval. I was one of them, by the way. I was number six on that, that <laughs> right? So uh, I have some right to speak about this. <laughs> so, and that's, that's, that's not there at the small bank. They are more faster, they are, are more agile. And I think by now, everyone knows there is a need to, to change and to be adaptive to change and to be agile. But uh, the, the fintech or the smaller company or the smaller bank is better, better equipped, I think, to do that. So, yeah, can, can you take one of those? Yeah. I have a slightly different view because, I mean, we took over good, the, good. The, Bring it the, on. the Hippo Alpe Adria Bank and we took the Austrian part of the Hippo Alpe Adria Bank, which is a small to mid-sized bank. And it is not about small or big banks. It is about actually the culture within the bank. It is actually creating that mind shift. And when you're working with a legacy bank, uh, whether it is big or small, irrespective, it is the people who are behind that bank which is important. So if you can convince them, if you can give them the right vision, and if you can give them a roadmap and create that excitement and enthusiasm that this change is needed, and like someone, one of the earlier presenters said, it's like the tsunami. But he didn't give them an answer as to how you should tackle the tsunami. You know, he said, you attack the tsunami, you can't attack. You have to flee from the tsunami. And that is not the answer in this marketplace. You cannot flee from the tsunami. So you have to find a way to address the changing marketplace. You have to find a way to convince your team, and you have to find a way to make them embrace the change and show them the roadmap, in my view. Yeah, but it's quite difficult, right? Because not everyone might feel just as well equipped to join that party. It is difficult, and I'll say to you, I mean, uh, uh, one bit of the background I forgot to mention was I did an MBA from LBS and Kellogg's and I was working with McKinsey in the financial and healthcare services many years ago. So there was a way which we could see models and change evolving. So when I took over, the, uh, when I bought the bank about four years back, it was an uh, old style legacy bank. Then we brought in fresh management to put the right systems and management systems and governance and risk systems. And after that, when we started to convince the team about the digital change, so we had created this roadmap of a platform bank almost two and a half years back. So that was a model which we presented to the management board and even to my other colleagues in the supervisory board almost two and a half years back, when many of the banks were and many of the tech companies were still thinking. We had planned the whole roadmap. And to convince everyone has taken me almost two and a half years. Now everyone is convinced, everyone wants to race ahead but it has taken two and a half years, and the whole, uh, the whole marketplace has completely changed. So we have to now look at a different way of embracing this new marketplace which has evolved within two and a half years. But it's and also that is the pace of change that we need to think about. But it's also indeed probably the rate of change outside actually helped you in the end get the decision done. 
because actually if you talk about something three years ago that wasn't visible yet and it's becoming visible to everyone right now absolutely yeah. absolutely and i think the that but you might be too later yeah. sorry but you might be too later if yeah we might be too late but i think the marketplace is still evolving there's a lot to be done we can learn from the mistakes of the fintechs because we know a lot of fintechs have succeeded but at the same time many fintechs in this marketplace have failed as well you see and have made many mistakes so i think it's a very interesting a uh, point that we are sitting on in the marketplace so we have to see the mistakes and see how we can make something which is very different and the team is fully enthused to now go forward yeah, this so change I'm, I'm very curious actually who uh, please go ahead i'm very curious also to hear about whether you actually think that that's a success or a failure when new companies fail because i think it's actually a, it's a rate of success i think if 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 many companies fail it's a success of an ecosystem yes you could but yeah i i think uh, when something new is happening it is bound to happen that many companies will fail because lots of people will make mistakes if you don't fall you don't try hard enough, absolutely right? and there's no such thing as a first mover advantage the i mean there was such thing as a first mover advantage but slowly we are realizing i mean you have the amazons and you have the google etc but at this moment in technology there's no such thing as first mover advantage so if a bank has started with this digital proposition early it doesn't mean that the banks who are coming on later cannot overtake and beat that proposition because technology is changing so fast and that's what i think cheers i just think it would be, it would be an interesting argument for you know when you tell an investor or a vc that they they just wrote off their investment that is the success of the ecosystem so that's a, that's a great argument no no but but it's but it's but it's Look, you just lost millions but, no, but uh, let's say <laughs> I, I hear very often the argument that says a lot of companies fail so they're not doing well well, I think it's more of a Darwinist uh, scheme where yeah, but, but you, need I think that to, you need parties to drop out. You need to just... So, so that, that's, a good, that's another good argument for investors. So look, it's Darwin, right? It's, uh, <laughs> but, but, but it's a risky job. Uh, huh? Yeah, but, but look, there, but that, that, that really, that's really the, that's really the difference, I think, between fintechs and banks. So fintechs want to be the cutting edge. They want to be the next big thing where banks need to stay relevant. So they need to develop new muscles that will allow them to stay relevant at... at uh, uh, at the changing in a changing market, in changing in fast changing environment, yeah. yeah. So it's not it's a very different mindset, I think, <laughs> between the fintech failure and bank failure in in that sense. No, so, but the, I don't think you should compare the failure, but more as in the sense that um, I think we just have to deal to to learn to work with smaller companies that have a higher chance of failing somewhere in the process uh, because they are smaller and therefore more fragile, perhaps. Right. So that's more sort of a. That could potentially be. So I'm very curious, actually, to hear your your thoughts about that. So, so, so I think that's one of the major challenges: how to partner with small tech providers, fintech yeah. and other tech providers. And I think that, by definition, it it is becoming part of the operational model of most, most banks because they need to move faster, they need to to immerse with the ecosystem and and try to tap into new innovation, new capabilities, talents that they don't have. Um, it's a major challenge. I think that it takes a very new approach to to GLC, so how you manage the risk, the liability risk, the reputational risk, uh, how you, you monitor the third-party performance, yep. and, and so on. Um, at least from my experience with Lloyd, so banks are building new and, and very innovative frameworks for, for partnering with small tech providers uh, rapidly, because one of the things with partnering with small techs is that they cannot wait yep. a year to, from the POC to the, to the commercial contract. So they need to. They can wait weeks. No, exactly. And and then you need to to be able to partner to validate capabilities, POC, and then partner rapidly. And yeah. and banks are, are building such such new capabilities. No, exactly. The, then the, the role of uh, the the partner, the bank as a partner, is actually might be the one to help them survive instead of letting them die because the process takes too long. So I think that at some point also, yeah, and I think at some point when banks will have their platforms up and running, so the API stores, the SDKs, it depends on the business model, API is a channel, the different terms, but essentially have the sandbox with enough APIs and documentation and, and a much better and holistic framework for, for partnering, so I think it will be much easier for fintech, yeah. for fintechs to, to work with banks. No, I agree. Uh, so, Yud, how do you do that? I mean, so one of some of the things you were mentioning is sort of the spin-out process as well, yeah. right? But how do you do the cooperative model? How do you see that work? No, I, I, I just want to refer to the fact that I, I truly understand that for investors, obviously, it's 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 a hard to lose money when a fintech fails. Uh, but within large corporate, I believe that uh, 
failure is really, really important for the, the learning curve. So uh, uh, the, the manier, the better, I would say, uh, because you uh, will understand what you need to do to improve things. Uh, and uh, what Amir said, um, I agree on that, that it will also increase the way that you develop things and bring things to market, so the speed uh, will increase as well. Because what uh, Abbott just said, the large boat is just slower. Uh, but you you develop the the capacities and uh, the, the the competencies that are needed to to increase the and and um, yeah um, scale up the the time to market uh, exactly. for new products. S small boat with punkers, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, how, how do you see then? Also, so let's say uh, uh, if you look into those bases, st still you're talking about really different animals, right? Uh, larger institutions, uh, heavily regulated, uh, f fast uh, vested interests. And the smaller ones, which might be very versatile, do good for experimenting. But then the cooperation is pretty tough. And I actually see that a lot of those corporations actually try to go around traditional procurement channels because they just can't make it work. But then again, is that actually sensible from a risk perspective, for example? Yeah, yeah. yeah. go ahead. Uh, no, that, that's one of the biggest challenges. Yeah? It's, it's like a kind of uh, outsourcing uh, risk. Um, to, to give you an example, what, what we are doing at Econbank, we are partnering up with, uh, with FinTax. So, for example, Funding Circle, the name was, was mentioned already. Uh, basically, Funding Circle is, is um, uh, providing consumer loan business, which in the big bank, the bank would do itself. So, even Emro has an own apartment. We don't have it. Funding Circle is doing it for us. But then there is the, um, the, the, the dilemma how to risk manage that, because ultimately the, the risk, the, the, the old-fashioned credit risk of that loan is in the, on the balance of our bank, Econ, Econ Bank, but it's originated by someone else. And he's not giving a, a fully uh, view on what he's doing, because that's a company by itself. Yeah? How he is selecting uh, his, his uh, customers, it's done with some uh, algorithm, uh, but that's, that's the, 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 the asset of, of funding circle. So it's not going fully inside, while I'm affected by that on, uh, on the risk management side. So th there's the challenge. Th th that's a challenge as well, how to manage that, because I still have the responsibility to manage this in a, in a controlled way, because I'm, I'm a bank with a banking license, so I'm, I'm regulated, so I should know the risks, and I should show that I understand them. So that, yeah. that's the biggest challenge, I think, in, uh, in, in these times. So partnering up is great uh, from a commercial perspective. It makes you more agile, you're faster. It's great for the customer, but there's also a risk challenge now arising. But, uh, but so it sounds like you actually don't feel comfortable in, let's say, the level of audit you can actually do on their processes. Uh, well, it's my task to, to, to be uh, comfortable. So that's, that's my challenge. So I'm doing my utmost best to uh, have everything in place to have that feeling. But that's uh, a challenge to, to get there. It's not easy. It's not like... Uh, th then it's more easier for, for a normal bank because then you can actually walk to the department and say, okay, what guys are you doing? What is the credit risk? What models are you using? Here you have the policy to do it. I can't do that anymore. Uh, the, the win I have, I'm more agile. I, I can go uh, out of the business quite easy as well. And all banks can't do that. So it makes me very flexible in my business model. But th there is an additional risk yeah. besides from, from other risks that are arising. So the... The, the task of the risk manager is becoming far more challenging. That's, yep. uh, that's my point. Yeah. Yep. So I think uh, uh, my colleague has pointed out a very valid point. We have to differentiate between customer acquisition and customer servicing. Mm -hmm. So the fintechs, uh, I mean, I'm all for fintech and I'm all for technology, so please don't get me wrong. But what I'm trying to say is that the fintechs may acquire the custom, customer, the customer acquisition is there, but how do you service the customer? How do you make sure that the risk of the customer is right for the balance sheet of the bank. How do you convince the regulator that this risk I'm taking, the right amount of capital is being allocated to that risk? Mm -hmm. And if you look at most of the fintechs, they have acquired a lot of customers. You look at Monzo, you look at Starling on the retail side, but they haven't actually become profitable because they have not been able to grow their asset book. The fintechs which have been able to grow the asset book, like Oak North, they actually have a full credit and risk team looking at every loan very, very closely and assessing the risk. Um, I've had direct experience with them, so I know what they do and how they do it. Sounds kind of old-fashioned. Yeah. So they're acquiring customers uh, through their internet portal, but just by servicing the SME customers because they can handle those loans. You know, They're not doing the retail customers because they don't have the credit and the risk appetite or the customer servicing potential to be able to handle the retail customers, and that's why they're profitable. 
Oaknot is the only profitable uh, fintech, actually, at least in UK. But I think they also have a different strategy with regard to indeed assets versus payments focus, right? So I think that a lot of the uh, new banks uh, hardly acquire any assets. They really focus on the payment infrastructure and account acquisition, yeah. uh, which is harder to make profitable in the small amounts. No, absolutely. So it is to be seen. I think that's where the, collaborate, the collaboration model is coming in. Yeah. So the hybrid model where you have to collaborate or you're looking at collaboration with the older banks and seeing that, okay, let us use their risk department because risk is going to become a big topic for all the fintech companies. And if they cannot see that coming, you know, I think uh, they will be hit by the tsunami. Uh, so do you, do you also think that, uh, maybe just to ask a little bit deeper, do you think that some of the risk capabilities of these, uh, these companies are actually too little developed? I think they have the automated risk, they have the uh, artificial intelligence, so you can do the credit scoring of a consumer. But if you really think about a retail customer, retail consumer, how much of unsecured loans are you giving them, number one? The margins that you are charging them is extremely high. So any NPLs against that portfolio can be balanced against your, um, your margins. Yeah. But once you start to go into corporate loans, once you start to go into SME loans, you need to understand the asset class. You need to actually do a proper structural uh, review because companies, uh, you know, the companies can go into bankruptcy and you can't have recourse to anything. At least yeah. in a retail customer, you can go after many things from them. Yep. So there's a risk which we need to understand. I'm not saying it can't, be it can't be handled or tackled, but once we understand, I'm sure we'll come up with a solution yep. on the technology but it, side. This indeed might be uh, also a challenge for the regulators, right? So, because yeah, I think we would, we would perhaps depend on the fact that they would actually put the right requirements at the table for these kind of activities. And that will happen once a large fintech, and that will happen once a large fintech fails. Like, <laughs> the, they're already looking at the funding circle model. No, there has been a big failure there. So, so, so uh, to, to your question, the answer, in my opinion, is yes. Most of fintechs, most lenders, um, are not very good at, in managing risk. So they've, they've managed to automate, uh, to a large extent, the process. Some of them use very good and new data sources. But if you look at the models they're using and their ability to develop new uh, internal models for, for assessing probability of defaults and, and affordability, uh, they're still very far from what you expect to see, and I think that that's one of the challenges and opportunities, how to reconcile the risk perception of banks and, and fintech as part of increasing collaboration. So allowing banks to assess in relatively short cycle the, the risk management and the risk models of fintechs. Yeah, I think that's also what the regulators still require, right? They, ask, they actually require banks to be in charge of their supply chain. So even though they, you work with an external provider, uh, through your banking license, you still have the obligation to make sure the process is in order according to your standards. Yeah. No. Uh, but it poses a lot of challenges for cooperation. Uh, exactly, that's exactly true, eh? and, 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 and right they are. Uh, and actually, the, the, the good part, looking from the positive, there, there's a win-win. So the, the, the fintech uh, or the supplier is uh, maybe better with the client than, than we as the old bank, but maybe we are a little bit better in risk management. So, so that's the combination I'm, I'm looking for. So I can offer them uh, a risk control framework or uh, uh, an, an enterprise risk management system, adapt it a bit for the, for the fintech, and I get back... Uh, a good client uh, client journey. So there, there's a win-win which I'm trying to uh, to manage. Yeah. So, so I think that those banks that that will make proper use of data, and the name of the game is data and models. So so they will outperform fintech. So if I think of just take Zest Finance as an example of a company that 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 offers um, credit decisioning models based on cutting edge machine learning. So if you take Zest and put it on top of a data set of a large bank that can do proper use of data. Phoenix cannot compete with that. that. That must be clear, right? No, I th but I think also, it's interesting, the, the competitive model of fintech is actually not that big, right? So I think in the end, there's some of them that might, might go into the market B2C, but many often they refer to B2B for the scaling. Uh, and then the other end, it's actually the other way around also. You can't start just B2B without any customers because no bank would ever do business with you. So you actually have to build your B2C proposition to get some traction. Uh, so, but it, it's, it's not real competition. You can show the way, but in the end, everyone's open for cooperation because the skill is just too, too much appealing, I think. I think, yeah. it's, I think it's also really, really hard for fintechs within the next five years uh, to develop a sustainable business model if they won't cooperate with, with traditional banks. Uh, um, they, they won't survive. They either ha don't have the cash or the, the customer base uh, to grow up. So, yeah. uh, Except for potentially, let's say, other parties with large network and capital exactly, that yeah. might be coming into the market like yep. big tech firms, big retail firms, e-commerce, potentially. But then they also enter the regulation part.
So I think uh, we are in a very interesting position where there is an opportunity for creating a hybrid model of collaboration. Mm -hmm. But even these hybrid models of collaboration can be defeated by a shrewd market player. I'll just give you a, a small example. And expanding on Thomas's story from this morning, you know, he was talking about this guy who had to pay one euro to get into a toilet for, because he didn't have 50 cents. I paid for the most expensive coffee this afternoon in the seminar. I want a cup of espresso. And I went down to the reception and they pointed me to the coffee bar. And this lady told me that, do you have cash? And I was pleased that I had a lot of cash. But she said that, um, you know, I don't have any change and we cannot give any change out of here. So I said, okay, can you take my credit card? So I said, no, our machine only accepts a Dutch debit card. <laughs> so I said, okay, great. So she said, but you can use my Dutch debit card and you can pay me, but I don't have change to pay you back. <laughs> Smart business model. So I said, I was so desperate for an espresso by this time. I said, okay, here is 10 euro. And she said, the, the espresso was two euros. So she was kind. She said, no, I cannot accept so much and tip from you. So I'll give you two banana bars. So I got two banana bars to hand out. <laughs> back to the trade, back to the trade. Very nice. It's actually nice, it reminds me a bit about the, the payment race that was done uh, around money 2020 as well, where basically from, from Turkey to Amsterdam, they had to travel by either by Bitcoin, so someone had just had Bitcoin, someone else just had, had gold, someone else just had a credit card, someone had, had, a, had a debit card, uh, and I think something like that. So it's a, it's, a, it's a lot of fun, I think, in the end, if you end up to figure out how all the different payment systems actually work, right? But, okay. On the side. Um, yeah, so it's definitely not a uniform market yet, right? So they, they will be shrewd market players. I'm saying they will be shrewd market players who will know how to defeat both the card and cash systems. And how do you tackle them? And you cannot tackle them either by the fintech way or the bank, old legacy banks. You have to come together to challenge these or, these or deal with the shrewd market players. That's what my message is yeah. from this story. Uh, exactly. yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Too. So I want to buy one banana bar. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's it, you have one buy. <laughs> 10 euros, I think, right? <laughs> no, so, so let's say, I think uh, some of the topics you already addressed is, uh, what I'm very curious about is actually the data itself, right? So I think we didn't touch upon that just yet. Is Okay, so our banks are sitting on the loads of data already. Uh, and on one hand, there basically uh, there have been an explore, exploration of uh, should they be using that data, and then how could they do that in a proper way? And we've seen quite some arguments that, that from time to time actually went completely off into the media in the wrong way. Um, and I think actually still we're not at the level that consumers feel very comfortable in just saying, you know, yeah, use my data and come up with something good. Uh, but then again, uh, for example, also over the past days, there was a lot of discussion about actually that there's a good room. If, if you are a good safeguard for money, you're actually also a good safeguard for data, right? But it's not about actually then using the data of the client, but actually helping the customer dealing with their data. So thinking about, for example, if someone's asking for your identity or for validation of your income or validation of your address or anything else, that you might actually be the agent as a bank to help your customer with that. Uh, and I think that is where PSD2 and GDPR come very nicely together. And I think it's sort of bringing us to a level of discussion on is that maybe the next evolution of a bank of to work with data. But then the question is, can banks do that? Yeah, I, I think um, it will be a, a really tough discussion with, uh, with the regulators, obviously. Um, but I think um, we're, we're on a... Uh, the, the biggest mountain uh, of data we can um, uh, forecast uh, um, divorces uh, and and things like that um, so um, yeah I think I think what you just said if we if we can be a safeguard for centuries uh, for money uh, why won't be can we do that for data as well um, Eben and I last week we we had a dinner together and uh, we discussed that um, uh, during a round table and I think there's a really feasible model uh, for that, uh, being a portal or a, an open platform uh, where you um, uh, develop something you can help your customers uh, how they uh, should use their uh, data uh, and, and which data they should share with, with companies um, they uh, yeah, get things from. Um, so I know within ABN Emerald we're now developing a portal 
uh, for living as a service so that we are uh, the yeah the, the hub or the portal between uh, suppliers in, in consumers lives uh, and the consumer who is being the owner of their own data uh, and that, that's all being designed on blockchain so that that looks really uh, really good uh, don't know what regulators think of it uh, yet but um, that I think that's uh, the most likely way to go okay. yep correct I think that identity and digital identity is, is the next big thing. Actually, it's the next big frontier, frontier because identity is the gateway to financial services, will become the gateway to financial services. So there is just too much money on the table, and GAFAs are, are too much ahead yep. in the game. And, and if you think of how much Google knows about me versus my bank, so you know, my bank just doesn't stand a chance. Okay, yeah. um, and, and in particular, if you think of PSD2 open banking and the fact that banks are obliged to share the data while GAFAs are still keeping the data yeah. and not sharing the data in a similar way, just increase the likelihood of GAFA winning the identity, digital identity um, uh, game. Yeah. Yeah. We still think indeed of financial data and other digital data to be completely different, but they become increasingly of equal value, right? So they should be regulated similarly. Is that also your point? Or in, in, in theory, yeah. Uh, <laughs> as it comes to identity management or identity assets, I think they do. So, for example, Facebook uh, did the financial in uh, industry a huge favor uh, with Cambridge Analytics uh, because the trust with banks uh, with regard to data is already very, hi very high. Um, and I think that uh, we you can use that as an advantage uh, on how we can um, yeah, mitigate all the risks uh, r r related to uh, identity management as well. Ebbe, what do you think? Uh, is that also part of your strategy uh, at Egon Bank? Um, yeah, but, but also looking at uh, what we can do with the, with the data we have uh, for the benefit for the client. So uh, an, an example, when I was still working at ABN Emro, we had the idea of uh, the client uh, seeing a house, making a picture with his iPhone of that house, and sending that information together with, with the, the, the identification of the client to the bank. And then the bank is able to uh, compute the house price based on the model because they provided so many mortgages in the Netherlands that they know quite exactly what the value of the house was. They know the, the, the client, so they know the credit score, and, and within two seconds they can give him back uh, a mortgage proposal. So, so that kind of, of um, responding to client needs there I see the most added value of the data that we already have, because this, this is data we already have. We might need a little bit more of technique to do this, but basically that's there already. And that would be added value for the client. So I'm more uh, focusing on, on using current existing data, maybe combined with other data which is free available, to do something for the, for the client. That would be an added value for, uh, for the client, I'm quite sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think this sounds like a very uh, useful case. Uh, just bought a house, so I would, be, would have loved to use it, but... Uh, <laughs> You see, I think uh, there's a misperception about data sharing and data analysis. I think with the new open banking systems, we will have to share our data with other banks. But is it the raw data that we are sharing or is it the analyzed data that we are sharing? Yep. You see, that is the question. The raw data we will share. The data analytics is a very important component and the internal knowledge of a financial institution. So if I have the data of my customers, if I'm analyzing the data within my own bank, but I'm not sharing that analyzed data with others, which maybe I will not be allowed to, because now I'm looking at the data in a totally different way. I'm processing the data to understand customer behavior, number one. I'm also trying to understand how the bank can improve its offering to the customer. So that power of the data analysis from the raw data, I don't think any bank will share. You see, and I don't think any regulator will ask any bank to share the analyzed data with another bank. So Having raw so data is not, a, not so very so useful. So just to understand, so basically you mean, for example, basing a risk parameter based on an analysis of the data, whether you would want to share that or not? Absolutely. That, I don't think uh, the regulator will force us to share that, that level of data. But it's one of ABN Ambrose products, for example, at the moment. Sorry? <laughs> So you it's one of the Ambrose products. Actually. You will share the analyzed data with, uh, say, my bank if I want it? They're providing a third-party risk scoring, actually. Yeah, right? exactly, yeah. No, risk scoring is different, but analysis of the data. See, risk scoring is different from really understanding customer segments. 
So this data which we are collecting will allow us to understand customer behavior, customer segments, you yeah. see? And okay. that is very different, and that is some of the things which Thomas was talking about in okay. the morning. Yeah, okay. uh, I understood. And so what do, you, what do you think then also about, because you, you talk about raw data or analyzed data, but how about basically derived data in the sense that, uh, for example, as a consumer, I might actually not be interested in sharing all my transaction data. I actually might just want to have validated that I have a certain income, or where my address is, or uh, that not my uh, birth date, but that I am of a certain minimum age, for example. So I would expect their also services to be quite relevant for consumers based on the data that banks have. Very well possible. No, I think so. And I think uh, once the consumer bodies become more powerful and they start to understand what is happening with their data, they will actually insist, because I don't think either the regulator or the banks are realizing that, but a time will come, say, three years, four years down the road, when the consumer bodies will become more powerful. Yeah. And they will say that, no, we don't want to share our raw data in such a manner. We will share our raw data behind a veil. And yeah. that veil could be blockchain. Because blockchain allows you to see a transaction has happened without allowing you to see the actual raw data. And that is the power of the blockchain, because it hides things behind a veil. So you know that a transaction has happened, that the transaction has been validated by other people, but you cannot actually see the transaction. Which means that it will be decentralized, not owned by banks. Yeah, not owned by banks, I agree. Uh, or a bank could be the agent that helps you sort out what you want to share, right? So it could still also be a service, actually, to mask the data or to derive the data. But, um, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, for, for me, it does, yeah. I, I, think, I think that um, is for, yeah, you... We've discussed it just before here. Is uh, you either become a front office or a back office, and um, um, if you're doing the back office really good, I think these are business models that would really work for the traditional banks uh, in the nearby future. Okay, yeah, I, th I think so too. So it's interesting to, to have, but it's quite early on, right? So I think indeed that probably we need the consumers also to be more powerful in their voice to actually start making a movement in this direction, because the, otherwise it won't happen. Uh, one thing I just wanted to touch upon, which we ha haven't discussed just yet in all the uh, different things that we mentioned, is actually the, the cyber risk, right? So I think as things ever become ever more digital, both within uh, uh, banks, but actually also uh, increasingly with more connections to the outside world, uh, of course, basically, uh, the risk of attacks, frauds, uh, everything basically becomes much bigger. How do we actually cope with that? I mean, still we see that the hum humans are quite a weak factor in, uh, in the whole protection th that we have of, right? So safeguarding customers' data is sort of the main assets that a bank has. But then again, basically every employee is sort of a ticking time bomb of letting, letting people in and showing, showing the way to the data. How do we do that? Anyone, any thoughts about that? Yeah, yeah it's, it's definitely one of the biggest risks. Huh? That's, that's for sure. Um, I came, uh, so I, I started at, at Egon Bank Knop uh, last last September, and I think in the, in, in the first months I uh, I was in the crisis management team because there was a, uh, an attack on on Knop, uh, actually for one of the first uh, first times, and the effects were minimal, but still it was a bit scary because something happening outside your span of control, someone else around the world is is, is attacking your your system, and indeed it's the it's the client that's often uh, the, the weak spot in this case. So if the client is paying attention, you can uh, you can stop it a bit, but you can't expect that from a client. Sometimes these things happen, and it, it's a bit scary. I was I was really um, it, it felt a bit like a like a war going on that you're in a war room and someone is really attacking you, and even if you have the feeling okay now it's over. You put down the phone, so you think you solved it, but it can happen in the five minutes' time. It will start, start again. Uh, I don't have the, the, the really the answer. Um, um, important, of course, is having the knowledge of your systems. That that did help me a lot. And because we are a new bank, uh, we knew we are quite aware what our systems are. Even the people that developed them were still in, and you really need them. So I was more comfortable with a new bank having a cyber attack than an old bank, where you might need some kind of COBOL programmer uh, 40 years ago to, to help you sort out what is really what is really happening. But still, it's um, yeah, it's, it's 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 on top of my agenda. Yeah, so we ha we had that two months ago, but it was on yeah. vacation. Um, <laughs> Oh, but that, that's a real problem. So the, 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 the attacks in the last few months, uh, the Netherlands was, uh, was facing some serious DDoS uh, attacks. Um, but customers, they don't care, right? Um, Google and Facebook, they don't have any difficulties with 
um, uh, giving this service. So I think that um, the legacy IT um, um, is is the biggest risk for the traditional banks on um, yeah offering that security to our customers. So I uh, really believe that all the data is is safe. So uh, none of the attacks came even close to uh, a, a piece of critical customer data. Uh, but that's not the point. Uh, a customer can't enter his his mobile app. Uh, um, he, he can't uh, contact our uh, service center because our systems are down. So I think that uh, yeah, what I just said, it's 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 a high liability of uh, of the service you're offering to your customers. No, exactly. Money, money needs to be accessible and liquid, right? So once you can't offer that, it's, you're it's, really in trouble. It's my money. Uh, that's why you hear what you hear customers say. It's it's my money. So I need to have access to that whenever I want. Yeah. Sanjeev, you wanted to uh, comment? Yeah. Some? I think uh, the actually having an old legacy IT system may be beneficial in this regard. You know, and um, let me present a contrary. Without in internet, you mean? Yeah. No. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> with with posts. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, because if you if you look at the hacker profile, it, they are very young. They're super intelligent. They're sitting at their home, and they have access to computers from anywhere. And they know that even if they are arrested, the criminal offense on them is going to be very small because you know it will be regarded. They'll be usually 14 to 16 year olds. The future hacker will be a 14 to 16 year old, you know, who's learned uh, computer coding at the age of five or six, and that is what is happening very very rapidly. Uh, how do you penalize them? So there is a threat here, and no one knows how to address it. Uh, some of the solutions that I've actually seen, which bankers can think about, is actually coming from Israeli military. You know, and I, was, I go to Israel quite a bit, and one of the solutions which I saw, which I quite found quite fascinating, was a completely, they cannot do it for the iPhone, unfortunately, but for the Android phones, they can completely replace the whole system and layer it with their own system. As a result, no app, nothing can put cookies or any other system onto your, onto your phone. You know, so they've actually made something which is hacker-proof on the mobile phone, but not on the internet. So at least if you have uh, your representatives or if you, if you have your own bankers, they can subscribe to such a model. So that may be we one did, solution. We did, however, see that uh, BlackBerry also thought that they had <laughs> created that, <laughs> which was not always uh, exactly safe. but. Um, but it's quite interesting, and indeed, uh, Israel is quite ahead in some of the security measures to take. What I think is I always find interesting is if you actually talk to security companies, is that they actually say, like, okay, we still got basically, if you ask probably people in the room here, uh, we could actually give that a try. Who th is, thinks basically that their organization is currently hacked, right? So basically in the past, uh, let's say in the past five years, right? So. I think there's now an uh, obligation to report this, right? So it can't be a secret anymore. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but let's say the, the, the problem is we still think that we weren't hacked. Uh, while a lot, if you ask the most security companies, they say, let's forget about all of that. Every company has been hacked. It just may take you a while before you actually find it out, right? So you better just assume and build all your processes around a hacked system rather than actually trying to say, let's build a very big wall and after, behind the wall, everything is safe because it's just not happening anymore, uh, especially now. Yeah. Very good point. Yeah, um, yeah I think it uh, would be good to uh, sort of uh, uh, finalize to say, but I think I'm not sure we covered all the aspects according to all the panelists. So maybe, uh, Jeroen, would you like to start and say if there's anything else that you would like to give the audience on your view of uh, risks in this uh, turbulent time of innovation? Uh, I, w I was wondering if, if, if somebody has a question, because the, um, I think we're... we're Sending out a lot of information and uh, well, Good our point. opinions, but yeah, I, th I'm, I always love the uh, interaction, uh, are the design sprints, uh, because it's a it's a moment of cooker pressure where you can um, get everybody on board and do things in five days time. So what we just did this day and uh, just left my team for three hours, um, we we designed a complete working. Uh, Google Home Assistant uh, in four days' time, um, with also with people from all the fourteen departments. Um, actually, there are nine, but they're all, they're all there, and they're not leaving uh, without their consent and being happy with what we delivered. So, uh, totally agree. Um, you cannot do innovation if it's not 
throughout and increment uh, incremented within the entire organization. Yeah. Anyone else wants to add to that? Or uh, no, but maybe um, uh, we talked a lot about about clients uh, today, which is uh, which is very good. Eh? Clients are really central, uh, very nice. Uh, but uh, I'm also a risk manager. Uh, and I, I would like to share a, a little uh, story about uh, client behavior, which might be completely different than than we uh, than we think. Uh, I was uh, last week. I was with my uh, with my parents, with my mother, and she was complaining about. Uh, sorry for that, Eben Emro, because she had an account over there, and she's 92. And and her uh, feedback to me was, yeah, I went to the office to do some things, and then I came back, and then Eben uh, Emro started calling me to asking for feedback, and I don't like that. I don't want to have. Uh, provide feedback. So that was a kind of an eye-opener to me that we say, okay, now you have to look at your client and uh, ask for information, but apparently there's a negative, there's a risk on that as well. Then I said, okay, I can help you. Uh, by the way, good to hear that you don't like ABM because now I'm working at Knop, so I will open a Knop account <laughs> for you. And I, okay, I'm going to impress my mother because we have uh, the perfect customer journey. We can open that account in two minutes. And I did so. Uh, but that was not giving any good feelings to her. She was just like, oh yeah, that's normal because that's the internet. She's quite techy savvy. She has an iPad and an iPhone. So I didn't impress her with that customer journey. Then after um, uh, two days, I, I had her on the phone and then she said, yeah, no, I really like Knop. And I was like, why? why? So, yeah, Because they sent me uh, the banking card and it's a white banking card and the number is with black digits. And finally, she's 92, I can read my bank number. Before that, she had ABN Emeralds, a green card, green numbers on that. She, she couldn't read that. So that was her customer experience. And that's why we as Knopf have a very high uh, net promoter score, apparently, because we have white cards with, uh, with black labels. And I had no clue, because I was not managing on that. So, so th it's that, it's I think, nice maybe one. is a good risk as well to, to tackle. The, the, maybe the client doesn't know what he, what he wants to have, and it's completely unexpected. So there's a risk we're managing on something. Uh, it does, however, sound uh, that you're actually very well listening to the feedback of the customer in this case. Yeah, in this uh, case, I did. <laughs> It was my mom. <laughs> and, but listen. and in the other case, it's actually quite funny that if you have a conversation, that someone else calls you for feedback. But okay, <laughs> yeah. never mind. No, but, 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 <laughs> but that's all driven by KPIs and result, right? So exactly. every everybody exactly. wants uh, the customer satisfaction. Um, yeah, if if that's one of the KPIs of the service center, yeah, that they will probably call you for feedback. No, exactly. But it's, it is quite silly, right? So that's yeah, yeah, uh, it's silly. Okay. So, so I think that trying to do it on a on a case by case basis is. Uh, is a sure receipt for failure. So I think it's more about building the frameworks, building the environment, okay, the guidelines, and then let the team do their jobs. Trying to do it on a case by case basis, case by case basis is almost impossible from my experience. It's just way too difficult. Yes. I think uh, the gone are the days when you can look at your CTO or your digital banking and put a silo around it, a vertical silo. You know, that is. Uh, akin to what one of the presenters said is creating a chief idiot officer to whom no one listens. So I think the view should be that how do we create a matrix organization where technology and innovation is driving across all the silos in the bank, so across risk, across treasury, across retail, commercial, whatever departments that you're functioning. And that is how one has to look at technology today. And if banks don't look at technology in that way, I think they will struggle to keep ahead with the time. And just talking about technology, I think we also have this uh, concept that older people are not technology savvy. You know, my parents, they live in India, but they are, they are much more comfortable with using the iPad and iPhones, et cetera. And they tell me that, see, if you could use the old-fashioned TV remotes, we can use these machines much faster. And that is actually true. Have you tried using the old-fashioned remote controls? They are difficult to, you know, if you can manage that, you can manage anything. So this, <laughs> this division between 50 plus and 50 below is no longer relevant because technology has become simple to you. Okay, yeah, for working with fintechs or actually in open banking, right? Is that, uh, okay. What do you think? What, what, what do you think are the best practices? I think, uh, well, Jeroen, I think you, uh, you, you gave your best example, I uh, presume. Uh, but maybe as, as one of you have an idea on basically some uh, uh, example of a bank who you think did pretty well in how they established their partnership model and opened up more of their infrastructure? I think uh, most of the big banks have, most of the big, big banks haven't started to do it as yet. They are just about thinking. I mean, few banks in Europe have started to do that already. But if you look at the UK, the big banks haven't started to do that. 
they are they are still thinking about it. They're still thinking about collaboration. They're still very nervous that if we start to uh, collaborate with the fintechs, uh, what will happen to our customers? So they are still very nervous. They still want to hold on when the time is to let go. So we will see. I think the next two years will be very interesting. The next two years will show how these collaborative models work out. And if you have the same conference two years later, we'll probably have a different perspective. Yeah, so, so, so that, that's very true. So today, they mainly do POCs, and those that survive the POCs and then the, the sourcing processes, so manage to partner with banks, we don't have too many good examples. I think that uh, there is a major opportunity for the Accentures and SAP of the world, actually, to, to take the, the contracting, the legal, and or the financial risks, and to keep, to keep it with them, and, and provide those services, okay? Um, under their master agreement with the big bank, so that it's an opportunity for everyone, I think. Uh, and again, at some point, I think that the banks will get back together and, and find a way to do it, but it's not happening yet. Yeah. In any case, they're all talking about it, so at least it might be something, right? So, yeah. Especially uh, Rolf Hamers also last week uh, opened uh, Money2020 with a big speech about opening, opening, opening. It was uh, all the time, so... You see, if, uh, if you look at the older banks and the bigger banks, what they have realized that they just don't have the capability or the capacity to innovate as fast as a fintech can. So they are realizing that just now. You know, they weren't realizing that before. So if you look at 10 years back, banks were trying to build their own digital and e-banking solutions, which they failed to do effectively. The fintechs also, by the way, are realizing that two and a half years back, if you look at a looked at a business plan of a fintech, they would show that the cost income ratio would be 20% with this particular model. Now, what the fintechs have realized in two and a half years is that they were underestimating that cost income ratio because they were not really taking into account the cost of having a full-fledged risk department and that the regulators are now putting pressure on them, particularly with the failures of funding circle. So their cost income ratio is now moving up towards 40, 45%. And the investors are asking from 20% to 40% what is happening. So they are also under pressure now to collaborate with big banks. And that's what I'm saying. The next two years would be an interesting change because both partners would want to collaborate, realizing each other's value. And this, that's when a true collaboration can really happen. Oh, absolutely. And I think regulation killed the entrepreneurial part over the last few years. Um, Please explain. Sorry? Interesting. Why? No, I think... I think um, if I, you I agree. I just want to hear your opinion. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, when I came in, um, I was previously a partner, a partner at an agency, and I came in with a lot of uh, uh, entrepreneurial energy. Uh, but that, yeah... All the risk-related departments, Ebbe, uh, uh, sorry for that. Um, uh, they 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 all said no, we can't, or we we uh, it's too risky, or uh, we don't know Facebook, or we don't know this, or uh, we don't trust Google. So uh, and they all came up with with um, rules and regulation uh, why we could not do that. Um, so that that we're risk avoiding, uh, yeah. Uh, but, but indeed, some of the standards are pretty old, and so it's hard to actually get them moving uh, uh, and actually adapt to the same, because the regulators are actually moving ahead now faster than often the compliance departments, uh, what I find from time to time as well. Um, but maybe I think we're, we're out of time, so I think the rest we should probably move over to uh, coffee or drinks uh, afterwards. Um, maybe one very short final remark from all of you, something that's still on your mind that you want to share? June. I Ever? think the sun's still shining and we just need to enjoy the ride uh, for more sunny days to come. I think uh, if, if we try... Good positive note. Yeah, no, Richard Branson once said, trying is making progress, so if we keep on trying, uh, we will make progress. Thanks. Ebbe? Oh, yes, yes, similar, but I always see, uh, see a great improvement. Uh, I remember being here on this stage 12 years ago, and, and the atmosphere is far, far better, far more in innovative, far more entrepreneurship. So we're on the right track, and more to come in the next two years, definitely. All right. Thank you. Uh, so, so, so we live in interesting times. Yeah. Um, so I think that not taking risk is not risk management, and that's, that's an important thing to understand. Yep. Um, and I think that there is a major challenge, major, for banks in the transition from from the existing GRC capabilities and know-how, so the governance, risk, and compliance yeah. around managing people, mainly internal people, internal teams, 
to managing machines and third parties. So there is a major shift and a major challenge both for the risk managers and for regulators of how to shift to managing machines, yep. or governance and risk and compliance around machines and third parties. Yeah, would agree. I think the, the change which is really going to come is when the consumers have power, when me as a consumer has power. When I'm saying to the banks and to my health organizations that I want the data that you have analyzed to be given back to me, and we should be prepared for that change because that is going to happen. We are in a very transparent uh, world due to the internet, and we have to embrace that change and we have to start thinking of that future. Well, thank you. Very nice insight. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed the discussion and found it enlightening. And uh, indeed, I think everyone will be more than happy to answer any questions furthermore in the break. Give our panel a big hand, everyone.